Book TV. The works of German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche in the last century are often quoted today in political and public policy discussions. Recently, we interviewed philosophy professor Stanley Rosen of Boston University, who's written a book about Nietzsche entitled The Mask of Enlightenment, Nietzsche Zarathustra. The interview is about 50 minutes. After the interview, we'll look at a philosophy book group in Maryland as they discuss Friedrich Nietzsche. Dr. Stanley Rosen of Boston University is in Boston, and we are in Washington, and we're going to have another one of those informal conversations we had a number of months ago when we talked to uh, Dr. Rosen about Plato. This time, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, tell me who are we talking about so we can get the correct pronunciation from you. Friedrich Nietzsche. Who was he? Nietzsche was uh, one of the most extraordinary thinkers and writers of the second half of the 19th century, born in Germany in 1844. Uh, he uh, had a relatively brief, productive lifetime. He went mad when he was approximately 45 years old and uh, died in 1900. So uh, we could call him an a, a, a extraordinary, influential thinker and one of the truly great prose writers of uh, German, certainly in the 19th century. That would be my first reply to your question. And how much have you thought and written about him in your life? Well, actually, I first started reading uh, Nietzsche when I was an adolescent. Uh, and in fact, in my day, that would be almost more than 50 years ago, uh, Nietzsche was not studied uh, really in philosophy departments and uh, was regarded as a kind of a, a mad poet rather than a serious thinker. Uh, that's uh, interesting because I kept reading Nietzsche for the next 50 years. And finally, uh, his influence caught up uh, with me here in the United States. And he's now one of the most widely read, most influential uh, thinkers of our time. And books pour from the presses on Nietzsche, uh, really quite unusual. So he's had a tremendous impact uh, in the uh, second half of the 20th century in the United States. Why do, you, why do you think? Well, uh, for several reasons. First of all, he's a, he's a man of extraordinarily powerful uh, rhetoric. Uh, some people would find the prose in Zarathustra uh, a bit too flowery and, and uh, passionate. It's written in the style of uh, Luther's translation of the Bible. But uh, his other works uh, are extraordinarily beautiful and uh, really extraordinarily articulate. That's the first reason, his great, his great uh, prowess as a writer. Secondly, however, Nietzsche uh, states in the most powerful way uh, a criticism of the modern epoch, and in particular late modernity, and still more precisely the, uh, the uh, latter end of the Enlightenment. He states with the greatest power uh, a criticism of that uh, epoch, which uh, has now become rather fashionable. Uh, there's a big fight going on, and ha has been going on almost since the, the beginning of the Enlightenment, uh, as to whether it was uh, ultimately good or bad. And uh, it would be going too far to say that for Nietzsche it's all bad, but uh, Nietzsche takes the, the, uh, the view that what looks to uh, others like progress, scientific progress, technological progress, materialism, egalitarianism, the spread of democracy, even the advent of uh, uh, national socialist, I don't mean by that the Nazis, of course, socialist parties, uh, m many people regard that as, as great progress. Nietzsche saw it uh, as great decadence. And this uh, quarrel uh, within the, uh, the heart of the Enlightenment is one that has been articulated in the most powerful way by Nietzsche. So if I could add, uh, Brian, one last point that occurs to me. Nietzsche is a prophet of revolution. And uh, to define exactly the content of the revolution that he advocates is not so easy. But one thing that is clear is that Nietzsche is preaching a destruction of traditional values, in particular the values of the Christian tradition, and secondly, but uh, with considerable importance, the values of the Greek philosophers. Nietzsche preaches creativity, originality, uniqueness, self-overcoming, and these have all become extremely popular uh, uh, notions in the 20th century. Think of all the liberation movements in our time. I mean, uh, the black liberation, women's liberation, gay liberation, all the uh, uh, revolutions by young people, 
which uh, you and I will still remember from, uh, if I'm not giving you too many years, from the uh, Vietnam times. Uh, people who wanted to break loose from society, break loose from the tradition, reject Christianity, reject uh, uh, the sterility of the middle class and of the bourgeois society, all turned to Nietzsche for uh, uh, solace and for inspiration. Whether he, would, whether he intended to give inspiration to these diverse groups, that's another question. But those are some of the main reasons why Nietzsche is so popular today. The impetus for asking you to join us again is uh, uh, Richard Hall, C-SPAN Richard Hall, produced an uh, event at Bibelow's bookstore near uh, Baltimore in Timonium, where the Philosophy Book Club meets once a month. And at the end of our discussion, we'll show that discussion among everyday citizens talking about philosophy. Let me ask you just a general question. What, what is the value to people who are adults sitting around talking about philosophy? Well, now, that's a rather difficult question to answer in a simple way. I would say for some people, there's no value at all. But uh, those would have to be extremely uh, thoughtless people who are, uh, we're going to exclude them uh, from this discussion. The group uh, that I saw, I looked at parts of the tape, uh, obviously consisted of very bright, concerned people who were uh, interested in understanding uh, themselves and uh, therefore in understanding the uh, structure of the uh, historical period that produced them. And in particular, they were clearly intrigued by the uh, extraordinary uh, power and I should say uh, ambiguity of Nietzsche's writings. So in other words, an intellectual treat, a sheer pleasure, and an, 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 an essential uh, uh, element in the process that characterizes us as a species, and that is that we want to try to figure out what it means to be a human being and how to live one's life, whether that be the life of a, a, a carpenter or an electrician or a physicist or a philosopher is really irrelevant. Ultimately, man, I think, if I may say so, is the philosophical animal. And so uh, in considering philosophy, we are simply exercising our common humanity. For those who missed our earlier discussion on Plato, would you mind going over the details on Dac Dr. Stanley Rosen? Uh, give us a little background. How long have you mentioned earlier about 50 years of teaching? Uh, well, it's 50 years of studying philosophy, yeah. I, uh, uh, I, I, I'm a graduate of the, uh, the old Hutchins College of the University of Chicago, and I went on from there to uh, take my doctorate with the Committee on Social Thought, uh, a very well-known uh, interdisciplinary program that has uh, had many famous people in its uh, faculty. Uh, and uh, then I studied in, uh, in Greece for a year. My wife was an archaeologist at that time. Then came to uh, Penn State University, uh, where I spent 38 years, with a lot of time, uh, you know, taken up by traveling or studying in various places in Europe and the United States. Then I retired in, uh, in 93 and took a chair at Boston University. Uh, where I now am. I'm the Borden Parker Bound Professor of Philosophy and a University Professor at uh, Boston University. How often can we find you in the classroom? <laughs> I, I teach a full load. Uh, John Silber, who as you know is still the Chancellor uh, of BU, wisely I think uh, insists that the senior people teach. That's uh, honored, uh, you know, there are one or two exceptions of uh, famous poets or novelists. But the academic people teach a full program, which is uh, two courses. And one is a graduate seminar that meets for three hours a week. The other is an undergraduate course. As it happens, I'm teaching Nietzsche's Zarathustra this semester. They're largely honor students, about 15 or 20. And that takes three hours a week. So it's five, uh, six hours of teaching, plus all the time I spend uh, with my graduate students, reading their dissertations, preparing for classes, and so on. What do you notice about the undergrad students when they come into the classroom? At what point do they start to understand this stuff? Uh, again, that depends on the kind of student. I, I, if, you're, if we're talking about the large 150 person uh, classroom, I'm, in fact, I've had as many as 350 in a classroom, there the, the problem is uh, extremely uh, serious because uh, there are so many people that it's hard to uh, focus their attention. They come from very diverse backgrounds. For most of these kids, philosophy is an, uh, a three-hour uh, requirement in humanities. Many of them are not at all interested, and they have to be made interested. And the only way to do that is by translating the material into uh, ordinary language, which uh, uh, goes directly to the roots of their daily lives. Uh, how deeply those roots uh, uh, go will depend upon how 
how well they respond. So th that's one group of students. And I've had some luck with, with these people. Uh, in particular, I found uh, teaching a, a novel like Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, which uh, is, is, is in a way closely connected with some of the themes, although it takes different positions, closely connected with some of the themes in Zarathustra. The real joy, however, is in teaching uh, the kind of course that I'm giving right now to what is essentially a group of honor students, say 20 honor students, who are there because they want to be there. They, in effect, begged me to put them. It was admission by instructor only. And this is wonderful because they're bright, highly intelligent, imaginative, eager to learn. They want to be there. And if I may say so, this might sound peculiar to our audience. They don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> that means that they're not, their brains are not obstructed by professionalism, as sometimes happens with uh, senior students or graduate students. They don't already know everything. They don't already have a rich culture. They don't already have a familiarity with the 10 or 15 different interpretations of Nietzsche. And so we can get right down to business and, and excite them, uh, you know, in a way like in a platonic dialogue, in which uh, Socrates is talking to young, uh, young boys who are, who are highly intelligent and, and simply they're, they're at that age in which they want to know what it is to be a human being, what is life all about, that, that kind of thing. So uh, that, that's uh, very exciting, but that's quite a different experience from the uh, teaching of uh, you know, large introductory classes. You keep mentioning Zarathustra, and I have here a uh, modern library series, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Yeah. Fill in a couple of blanks for me, and I, I admit to not having paid a great deal of attention, but the movie came out 2001, Odyssey, years ago. And, and I, I think I remember the theme song being Thus Spoke Zarathustra. That was uh, by Richard Strauss, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. It had nothing much to do with Nietzsche. I mean, it was, uh, uh, I did see the movie many years ago, but uh, Strauss wrote a piece which was clearly inspired, to, he was inspired by, by Zarathustra. Uh, I wouldn't be able to give you a commentary on the piece out of the text, however. But what I guess my question was, what, who is there? Ah, Zarathustra? that's a different matter. And how, yeah. Yeah, and how, does it, <laughs> how does this all fit? Right, right. Uh, Zarathustra, the figure, is uh, uh, a, 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 historically a, a, a Persian who is reputed to have been the uh, father of uh, mor moral, moral, uh, moral philosophy. We could put it that way. Philosophy is a bit formal. Uh, he was the, the father of morality, according to that tradition. And Nietzsche uh, chooses him as a prophet of a new morality, which Nietzsche personally is in the process of developing, you see. So Zarathustra is symbolic of the beginning and the end of the long tradition of the uh, Middle East and Western Europe, the long tradition of morality, which Nietzsche is now going to transcend. One of Nietzsche's most famous and, I think, best books which he wrote as a, a, an attempt to explain Zarathustra, which people found difficult to understand, is called Beyond Good and Evil. Now, the phrase means not that Nietzsche is an immoralist, but that he is an amoralist with respect to the tradition. That is to say, beyond good and evil lies a superior version of goodness and evil. So Zarathustra is a kind of symbolic figure for a shift that is coming. Zarathustra is a prophet, a prophet of a new morality. And the morality, of course, uh, is the one that, uh, that Nietzsche uh, articulates uh, sometimes uh, mysteriously, but sometimes with great power in Zarathustra. Go back to Nietzsche as a person. Uh, again, what year was he born? 1844. And do you remember his exact age when he died? He died in 1900, but uh, he had been mad for a good 10 years before that. Where was, he, words, where was he kept for those 11 years that he was, or 10 years? Well, most of the time he was kept at home by his sister who took care of him. I can't tell you exactly where he must have died in a you know in a hospital. I saw happened to see his death head in uh, in Stockholm. It's very impressive, but uh, I, I honestly don't remember uh, you know where he died. But that was the the his life was quite tragic. Uh, he was he suffered uh, really from his uh, mid twenties, early twenties, from terrible vision, serious migraine headaches, nausea, and yet he produced uh, you know thirty or thirty five volumes of uh, really gorgeous uh, prose, very deep prose always ill, and uh, at, at, at the age of uh, 45, uh, he went mad in Italy. And uh, his sister uh, got a hold of him and took him home and, uh, and uh, took care of him for the remaining 10 years of his life. Was he married? No, no. Well, it, it, his relationship with women uh, is uh, not clearly known. I mean, uh, it, the assumption is that he was entirely chaste, never had any relations with women. He seemed clearly to be in love with a, with a woman named Lou Salome, 
who also wrote a book about him, uh, a woman of uh, some uh, interest in her own right. But uh, they had intense, it was a kind of platonic love affair as far as we know. Uh, they had intense philosophical discussions. Uh, otherwise, Nietzsche lived a life of almost total solitude. I mean, he spent his life moving from one furnished room to another, uh, changing uh, uh, location in accord with his very bad health, you know, always looking for a place where he could breathe more easily and, and uh, be freed of his nausea. It was a lonely, lonely existence, but uh, one which was uh, spiritually as rich as, as that of anyone I know in, this, uh, in the last 200 years. Well, if he wrote 35 items of material, how much of that do we know sold back then? Well, Nietzsche uh, uh, didn't sell much at first, but he soon became rather popular, uh, and uh, uh, especially uh, after the, uh, you know, when he was, uh, the 10 years or so when he was already mad, uh, people from all over Europe were uh, beginning to, intelligent and uh, highly uh, artistic people were beginning to discover Nietzsche. His influence grew steadily throughout the uh, first half of the 20th century. I mean, people like uh, D.H. Lawrence, the uh, English novelist, G.B. Shaw, Man and Superman, you know that play. Uh, Strindberg, uh, Thomas Mann, the German novelist who moved to the States. Uh, the, really, the list of people influenced by Nietzsche is endless. Even Sigmund Freud, who denied, <laughs> incidentally, he denied having studied Nietzsche, uh, clearly was influenced by Nietzsche and borrowed a number of notions from him. So one could say that Nietzsche's uh, influence uh, exploded all over, the, all over Western Europe, certainly Russia and uh, North and South, Amer South America. You know, if you get on Amazon.com uh -huh. um, and, and put in the name Stanley Rosen, yeah. uh, you come up with, uh, oh, I don't know, at least 23 different items. Um, Some of them are written by a, an imposter who's a specialist in Chinese studies. <laughs> in other words, there's another Stanley Rosen. But, but the point I wanted to make, though, is that yeah. you've written a lot, and I've got, I have. I've got one of your books here, The Mask of Enlightenment. Um, yes which is about Nietzsche's um, Zarathustra. Correct. When did you write this? Uh, the book is a, a, a consequence of uh, lectures, graduate seminars that I have been giving on, on Nietzsche on and off for, oh, I don't know, 20 years. But the, I actually sat down and put the manuscript together in 1993. Is it available still if people want to buy it? Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's, uh, it's uh, published by Cambridge University Press and uh, is easily available. Now, if, you know, let's say uh, 150 years from now, uh -huh. people are looking around and they say, oh, there's uh, the Stanley Rosen, the philosopher. Well, is there a Rosen philosophy? Uh, no, <laughs> not, in the, not in, the, in the sense that I suspect you mean it. I am not one who has built up a, a, a system uh, which purports to give the uh, principles of all things, and uh, nor am I in a happy position of being able to clear up all the, the mysteries of human life. Uh, my philosophy, if you want to call it that, is uh, really inspired most by uh, the Platonic Socrates. Uh, I'm a, a, a man who, like many others, has devoted his life to examining fundamental questions, fundamental principles, and trying to understand how these fundamental principles have been spelled out in the history of philosophy, and the shape that they've taken in our own time, and what the... You know, every age has crises, we have our crises, and I've tried to take some tried to find my bearings and to help my students to find their bearings with respect to these, uh, these philosophical crises. So in short, uh, many of my books, not all, but many of my books are about somebody else. I've written books about Plato or Hegel or uh, uh, Nietzsche. I've written books about Heidegger and so on. Uh, and uh, that's not because I'm a pure philologist or scholar, but because I believe that uh, uh, philosophy must be studied in the context of its development from the beginning because uh, it's not like science in which only the latest results count you know and the, what happened previously has been transcended uh, since i don't believe that there are any final answers to the deepest human questions uh, i think it would be really quite foolish to uh, reject the thoughts of the wisest members of our race so uh that's the rough story of uh, where i stand on philosophy i don't know if this works or not but if uh Nietzsche were here today, mm -hmm. based on what you know, yeah. and I, this sounds, may sound like I'm reaching, but what would he think of the discussion in this country ongoing, at least the history of this network, 21 years, on abortion? God. I mean, how would it fit into his morality? 
I honestly, you know, can't give you a direct answer to that question. It doesn't, it doesn't come up uh, in so many words. We would have to uh, reconstitute a, a position for, uh, for Nietzsche. And I would say there that uh, for Nietzsche, the issue of abortion is not as it is for most of us today, or at least that's the, the, the way in which the, the issue is argued today is, as you put it, a moral question. In other words, is a fetus uh, a living being? At what age, at what stage of the fetus, the development of the fetus, uh, does the soul, religious, religious people talk, uh, manifest itself? You see what I mean? It's a moral question. For Nietzsche, it would be a political question. That is to say, Nietzsche would ask, if we are going to, something like this, if we are going to produce a race of what he calls in Zarathustra, supermen, funny expression. In fact, uh, the standard translator, uh, Walter Kaufman, calls it overman because he doesn't want people to get mixed up with the comic strip character, you know, Clark Kent. However, uh, it, it, to try to answer your question uh, by some kind of indirect uh, construction, uh, if our goal is to produce a superior race, then abortion in principle is not uh, to be rejected by Nietzsche. For example, let me give you a, 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 an example from Plato. Uh, in Plato's Republic, uh, reproduction is very carefully restricted by class. In other words, the most intelligent, superior people must breed only among themselves. Suppose a, a member of the most intelligent or highest class of philosopher kings, as they're called, guardians. Suppose one of them breeds with somebody from uh, the lower classes, the workers. Uh, that child will be exposed at, on birth and, or aborted if, uh, if uh, it's discovered before it's born. The reason for that is that uh, for, for Plato in the Republic, in order to have a superior city, you must have a superior ruling class. And Plato knew, or thought he knew, from uh, the process of breeding dogs and breeding uh, animals, that people could be bred in the same way, and that you had to have uh, uh, the children of superior parents uh, as uh, uh, members of the highest class. Now, that's Plato, but I mentioned it because it, it really casts a bit of light on, on, on the answer to what Nietzsche would have said. I, I mean, Nietzsche, I don't think, would have had any uh, interest in aborting children for the convenience of the mother. I mean, again, this issue is played out, you know, in terms in the United States, which would not be uh, applicable to uh, understanding Nietzsche's own position. But we can summarize this, uh, this uh, line of thought as follows. Uh, whether children are allowed, infants are allowed to live or die is a, a political decision. And that in turn is made on the basis of the intrinsic splendor of the culture and values of the civilization that we're building. And you might say, well, isn't the... Uh, uh, isn't, some people would say, isn't abortion itself a defect of our civilization? And Nietzsche would say no, in my opinion. Now, you know, if you ask someone else, you might get a different answer. But I think Nietzsche would say no. He would say you, that's sentimentality. That comes ultimately from Christianity. Now, there are many people who are not Christians who are, who are, who are opposed to abortion. Nietzsche would have called that secularized Christianity. In other words, the Christian morality transformed into a morality for non-believers, but people who have still been influenced by Christianity. He would have said the same thing about socialism, for example, as a kind of secularized Christianity. So is that helpful at all? In, in, uh... Yeah. What would he have said uh, if he were here at the table this morning? What would he say about the fact that this is um, one of the largest church-going countries in the world, or the highest percentage of people in the world that go to church? Uh, and also, that, uh, what would he say about our democracy? Nietzsche... What, uh, you know Karl Marx's famous uh, phrase, uh, religion is the opiate of the masses? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, for Nietzsche, look, I can answer you in this way. Nietzsche wished to destroy Christianity and replace it with another religion, a religion of the superior human, the superior human being. In other words, Nietzsche's teaching is a very radical, uh, extremely rhetorical version of what's been going on in uh, modern Western Europe for the last 300 years. I mean, uh, it's a kind of uh, carrying out of Descartes, the French philosopher and mathematician's statement in his Discourse on Method, that science, and with it the correct philosophy, will enable human beings to become as masters and possessors of nature. That was back in the 17th century. Now, obviously, uh, uh, if we become masters and possessors of nature, that means that we throw out the previous master and possessor, and that's God. So, I mean, there's an intrinsic atheistic element uh, in modernity and in particular in the modern philosophical tradition. That's not to say that all modern people are atheists, but that has to be recognized. Nietzsche is another one, as was Marx, of those people who wishes to uh, allow for a superior, the development of a superior human being. And in order to do that, he sees that we have to destroy the culture that has produced the previous human beings. 
So that's that's uh, uh, that's uh, uh, one part of my reply to you. Now, what does religion have to do with this? Well, the re the previous religion, let's just call it Christianity, must be destroyed because the values of Christianity have been a, a major uh, ingredient, if not the major ingredient, in the preparation of corrupt people. I mean, now let's put some flesh on those bones so that your audience can know exactly what Nietzsche didn't like. He did not like weakness. He did not like pacifism. He did not like egalitarianism. He did not like Jesus turning the other cheek. He did not like Jesus appealing to the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and the halt. He saw Christianity, uh, if I may put it colloquially, as a religion for losers. He wanted to uh, inculcate a spirit of warrior-like creativity, of people who would not be bound by sentimentality for the average person or for the, uh, the inferior person or for the disadvantaged, as we call them today. Uh, for, to, to Nietzsche, this would have all been sentimentality. So he would, he would not at all have been impressed by the fact that we're all going to church. Uh, the second point you asked about was democracy. Now, this is uh, interesting, Brian, because Nietzsche today is extraordinarily popular, uh, not, not simply among right-wing thinkers, but among left-wing thinkers as well. I, I mentioned earlier in this discussion that there are, uh, our, our century, the 20th century, has been one of uh, any number of liberation groups. Uh, it's also been a, a century of uh, the spread of uh, democracy. Uh, it's been a century uh, of uh, uh, the spread of ideas of egalitarianism, fairness, and so on. I mean, these are terms that intellectuals in, in London or Belgrade, as we now see with excitement on the, on the television, or New York, all use with equal uh, frequency. Uh, Nietzsche was uh, really opposed to that. I mean, Nietzsche was what I would call a, a revolutionary of the right. He is confused uh, by, I think, many well-meaning uh, people from the left uh, because he's confused as, as a spokesman for, for their views because uh, he talks a great deal about uniqueness and creativity uh, and individuality and so on. But what he meant by that was that the Superman would have to create a new civilization such that the non-creative people, namely the great majority, would benefit simply by participating in it. In other words, by exemplifying the values of Nietzsche's morality, which would replace Christ's morality. I mean, uh, from a Christian standpoint, uh, Christians are uh, uh, obedient to the teaching of Christ. Nietzsche wishes to replace the teaching of Christ by his own teaching. One of the books that he wrote was called The Antichrist. <laughs> the last work he wrote, Eka homo, you know, it's a biblical expression, behold the man. Nietzsche, quite seriously, uh, saw himself as a great historical rival to Christ. That was his ambition, to replace everything having to do with Christianity. And democracy, unfortunately, for uh, our own uh, taste, from Nietzsche's standpoint, democracy was, uh, was inferior. It was a kind of version of the sentimentality that one sees exemplified in Christianity. So those are my answers. They're not very pleasant, I'm afraid, <laughs> to, to contemporary taste, but uh, those are the answers. Now, may I add that if you have five other people on your program, uh, you might get five different answers. I uh, don't think it's, uh, that they would be right. I mean, I think that Nietzsche was not a liberal. He was not a, a revolutionary in the, in the left sense of the term. He was a, a, a man who believed in rank ordering. As he often said, my key concept is rank ordering. He was a man who believed in the nobility, the nobility of the spirit. He despised the rabble, the people, the crowd, as he called them variously. He wished them no harm. On the contrary, he wished to raise them up. But the only way in which they could be raised up is by being trained properly, if I could put it that way. I'm speaking for Nietzsche, not myself. The only way in which the people could be raised up is by, given, by being given a proper education. I mean, this is not a notion that is foreign to us today. But the content of the education that they would be given would be quite different from the one that uh, obtains in modern uh, 20th century European democracies. So in short, anti-religious in the traditional sense and by no means in no sense of the term a democrat as that word is used in contemporary political discussion professor stanley rosen who teaches at boston university is in boston talking with us about friedrich nietzsche nietzsche depending on how you want to pronounce it and uh, he'll be with us for about another <clears throat> 25 minutes or so and we're leading up to watching the philosophy book group that meets monthly at the bibelot's bookstore in timonium which is up near baltimore about 40 45 miles from where we are here in washington um i want to ask you uh why should we care what this man thinks and and who has made him someone that you read and think about his extraordinary influence 
And when I say that, I don't mean that the influence necessarily worked out as he had intended it. But uh, Nietzsche states uh, in the most effective way that I'm familiar with the following view. Traditional philosophy, traditional morality is all a lie. Life is in fact chaos. That is to say intrinsically it's chaos. Whatever order exists in the world has been produced by human beings. Orders live, are born, live, mature, grow old and die just like individual people. When an order, a political order or a social order or a set of values, a society, a historical epoch, all of these terms amount to much the same thing. When such a, a, a structure begins to uh, get old and to deteriorate, then it leads to what Nietzsche calls decadence. I mean, decay. And if the decadence is allowed to proceed untreated, you could make a medical analogy here. In other words, if you have a tumor and you don't treat it, then it's going to spread throughout the body politic and it's going to deteriorate uh, the standards and the uh, values of the uh, uh, civilization. And this will be uh, a long, drawn out process in which people will become more and more decadent and more and more uh, mediocre. Consequently, what we have to do that is to say what a man like Nietzsche has to do, is to destroy that, destroy that civilization. And he states very radically uh, the need to destroy tradition. And that is a very appealing. I mean, the 20th century is a century uh, still of revolutions. And he also uh, uh, speaks very, very uh, clearly uh, about uh, the uh, inadequacy of morals, moral teachings which restrain us and people who don't wish to be restrained by moral teachings, who don't wish to be, as they would put it, uh, slaves of a supernatural being, uh, find something extremely appealing in Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche was influential in bad ways, very bad ways. For example, he influenced, not intentionally, but the Nazis were influenced by Nietzsche. I mean, there are horrifying passages in, in Zarathustra. Uh, one passage about the blonde beast who will come down from the north, you know, into the the plains of the Mediterranean and destroy the mongrel races that are living there. I mean, that's, uh, you know, Hitler uh, uh, and his propagandists made use of passages of that sort. Because Nietzsche, as part of Nietzsche's uh, teaching about uh, uh, the Superman, there was a kind of biological uh, Superman, uh, uh, the notion of a biological Superman, of a, of a being of enormous strength and health. Nietzsche himself was quite sick, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, people have speculated, you know, that he had a kind of almost desperate romantic uh, uh, interest in and enthusiasm for health uh, because of his own uh, miserable physical existence. However that may be, uh, Nietzsche had uh, uh, influences which, uh, depending upon your own political standpoint, were uh, either good or terrible, but they were enormous. And uh, one has to understand, I think, you know, the conditions of one's own time, and one can only understand that by studying the great masters, people like Nietzsche, who prepared the time in which we live. Uh, is that a helpful answer to your question? Yeah, but d could you do this? And this may be a little bit uh, harder. Uh, it, it, who in this country today that we know, or maybe a better a profile of the person, would be walking around with thus spoke Zarathustra in their pocket as kind of their Bible? Can you define the kind of person, the kind of thinker today? Well. Uh, again, I have to begin by emphasizing that Nietzsche is sufficiently difficult to understand and sufficiently ambiguous that he's inspired people of widely disparate views. So you could find, using this terminology of the left and the right, not in any polemical way, but simply uh, because I think everyone's familiar with it, uh, you will find people on the right who are very impressed with Nietzsche's critique of Christianity as a kind of religion of, as I put it earlier, losers. A religion which uh, weakens the distinction between the noble and the base, which turns our attention from the high to the low. Let me jump in to ask, when you say the right wing, but yeah. would right wing born-again Christians feel that way? No, I doubt that they'd ever heard of Nietzsche, but I mean... Uh, well, uh, would they agree with his discussion? Well, let me, let, me, let me give you a specific example. Uh, perhaps uh, one of the two or three most famous philosophers of the 20th century, a man named Martin Heidegger, uh, dead for some years, a uh, German philosopher who wrote a great deal on Nietzsche and who shared uh, Nietzsche's uh, distaste for modernity and uh, for many, if not all, of the same reasons. 
uh, I don't think that you would find Jerry Falwell uh, appealing to Nietzsche because Nietzsche is an antichrist. But uh, those people who saw themselves as freed or wishing to be freed from the traditional forms of uh, uh, Judeo-Christianity or for that matter Islam, uh, those, those who in particular saw themselves as wishing to be freed from Christianity would find Nietzsche extremely appealing. Now, who are the people who wish to be freed from Christianity, just to follow out the single thought? Well, they can be on the left or the right, right? I mean, there are right-wing atheists and there are left-wing atheists. Left-wing atheists, I mean by that, again, nothing abusive, but uh, people who uh, believe that uh, man makes his own values and uh, we must respect each individual person and we must be fair and just to everyone and there is no single uh, point of view that is truly right. Religion and even many philosophies are therefore quite dogmatic. And uh, that leads to a notion of a kind of an egalitarian democracy. Now, these people could find themselves uh, using Nietzsche uh, to justify some or all of their views. Sometimes they would be right, sometimes they would be wrong. Nietzsche was anti-Christian, but he was not a, he was not a Democrat. So uh, one has to reply to you rather cautiously. You could find uh, admirers of Nietzsche in almost every sector of the intellectual world. And that's why the cumulative effect of Nietzsche's uh, writing has been so powerful. Go back to uh, when he lived. Uh, did yep. he have uh, parents alive when he was r doing all this? His father died at a relatively early age. Uh, his mother lasted longer. And uh, uh, he, however, uh, once he passed, you know, he was a, a university professor in, in his early 20s. And uh, then just went off on his own. He knew he had a, he had a mission. He had to write these books. And uh, he, had, he wanted complete independence. He had a very small pension. And uh, I think his mother sent him some money. They were, he was extremely poor, you know, by any normal standard. But he had just enough to live on. And he preferred to live alone. He didn't live with his family. Where did he, well, first of all, where was he born? He was born in Germany, a, a village called Röcken, a little village. I think that's the name. Uh, and uh, he, went to, uh, he went to school in uh, he went to a, what we would call a, a, a classical uh, uh, gymnasium, that's to say, what we would call a, a high school, something like that. Then he got a job teaching in Switzerland, in uh, Basel. He was a professor there. But uh, for various reasons, one of which was his health, he gave that up uh, at quite an early age and took his small pension and whatever money he got from his family and proceeded to, uh, to spend the next uh, 20 years writing these thousands and thousands of pages in one small furnished room after another, many of them in mountain areas in Switzerland. Uh, he ended up, for example, in northern Italy. He went mad in Torino, uh, which uh, still has a sign on the house that uh, he lived in, you know, in the final days of his sanity. And, and how, did, I think I've read either in your book or somewhere that syphilis was the cause of his insanity? That's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that's the, 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 the consensus view of the medical people. Uh, he was uh, himself uh, a, a medical orderly during in the war of Franco-Prussian War, you know. He served as a medical orderly and uh, apparently he got infected while treating somebody. Medicine obviously was not as, as uh, advanced as it is today. He apparently got infected uh, uh, from someone who had syphilis and uh, got it and the result was paresis. Now, no one knows this, no one knows for, for absolute certainty that Nietzsche did not contract syphilis, you know, directly. But that's, that's the story that, uh, that I think is currently uh, uh, accepted. Now, what was his relationship with Richard Wagner, the uh, composer? Yes, yes. At a rather early age, he attracted Wagner's attention, and they became rather good friends. Wagner was a very tyrannical man, rather nasty bit of goods, if I may say so, anti-Semite and uh, uh, lots, of, lots of faults, quite an egomaniac. But uh, he liked Nietzsche because he saw Nietzsche's genius, and Nietzsche revered Wagner in the early stages of uh, their friendship. He revered Wagner and thought of him as uh, a, a, an artist of uh, universal competence who would be able to produce works of art that would contribute to you know, the elevation of uh, the uh, spiritual development of European man. At a certain point, however, when Wagner became extremely sentimental and celebrating uh, Christian elements in his operas, Nietzsche became disgusted with him and broke with him. He wrote a book called uh, The Fall of Wagner, and uh, uh, Wagner became extremely irritated with him, and their, their relations were ruptured. But Nietzsche uh, apparently retained a, a, a lifelong uh, uh, respect for the influence that Wagner had had on him, and he also liked Wagner's wife very much, Cosima. 
It's interesting that a man who lived this life of complete isolation, uh, he had one or two male friends, but uh, the two people who made, uh, I would say, the greatest impression on him as human beings uh, were uh, Lou Salome the, and Cosima Wagner, who were both women. Richard Wagner, uh, to be sure, but only for a short period of time. You know, today, if you uh, were to analyze the success of a lot of people in our society, you would always go back and find the great mentioners, the, whether it's politics or philosophy or professors or entertainers. I mean, somebody somewhere mentions people, and that's how the whole thing begins. Uh -huh. If you went back in his life, when would you find people starting to mention Friedrich Nietzsche? What, you know, was he discussed in the papers? Was he discussed by others publicly? When did he come into the public being where people all started to say, this is somebody you got to read? Yes, I would say that began uh, in the period, oddly and sadly enough, uh, after his, uh, during his madness and after his death. In other words, 1890, 1910, thereabouts, Nietzsche began to become an international figure. Who did it? Who well, made him? Uh, some of the people whom I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, Strindberg and uh, Shaw, uh, great variety of uh, uh, writers and artists. Uh, who's, in other doing words, it, who's doing it now? Who's well, now, it? yeah, now Nietzsche is, is the hottest item in, uh, in publishing. Uh, my, one of my publishers, uh, editors, told me once that uh, you, we could publish a book called Nietzsche's Laundry List, and it would still sell 5,000 copies. Why? Well, uh, it would be difficult for me to, to answer that without repeating uh, many of the things I said before. Yeah, but I mean, is there, <clears throat> is there a, are professors in schools like yourself saying you got to the, oh, yes, you no, gotta the, study this guy? Yes, yes. I mean, Nietzsche is extraordinarily popular. Uh, I think perhaps the best answer I can give you is this. It was the influence of Martin Heidegger, whom I mentioned previously, uh, that really led to the explosion in our generation. In other words, Heidegger published his major work on Nietzsche in uh, 1960. And uh, Heidegger was a man of world uh, influence, and he influenced in particular a, a school of uh, French thinkers who are variously known as postmodernists or deconstructionists, people like Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault, to mention the most familiar names. And these people uh, were very much influenced by Heidegger and through Heidegger uh, by Nietzsche. And they spread uh, the picture of a revolutionary, what I was calling earlier, I hope not in, in, any, in, in any confrontational manner, I was calling it a left-wing Nietzsche. And this became extremely popular uh, in the United States. Uh, I can also indicate it to you in the following way. Uh, in, in, the, in the American academic philosophical community, for, let us say, 50 or 70 years, uh, philosophy was dominated by people with uh, strong interests in science, mathematics, people who uh, regarded themselves as analytical thinkers rather than synthetic thinkers with broad visions of human life. Now, uh, to be quite candid about it, uh, except for the professionals themselves, uh, the students are not interested in this sort of thing. And many people who, uh, who, are, who are not professional philosophers, but who are academicians, are looking for something richer than the, you know, no matter how wonderful it may be in itself, the analysis, precise analysis of concepts, structure of mathematical arguments and so forth, that doesn't give you a lot to live on. And Nietzsche gave us uh, an extraordinary portrait of uh, human existence. I mean, we've managed to cover, you know, only the most exciting and notorious aspects of the teaching of Zarathustra. But in Nietzsche's 30 volumes, you will find discussions of, of world literature, of the Greeks, endless discussions of Greek, Greek civilization, Greek archaic civilization. You will find elaborate, not always philologically accurate, but nevertheless elaborate criticisms of German philosophy of the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, all of this, uh, this, this extraordinarily gorgeous prose, this very provocative writing, these wonderful observations on Stendhal and on uh, uh, Heinrich Heine and on uh, political events and on human psychology. And I'll, I'll end that with this, with this point. Nietzsche was a master psychologist. And this is, uh, among other things, an age of psychology, you know, the age of anxiety, the age of Freud and Jung and so on. And Nietzsche there, too, is one of the great, great psychologists. He, when he discovered Dostoevsky, incidentally, he said that Dostoevsky was, was uh, uh, the other great psychologist. I mean, if you think of novels like The Brothers Karamazov and The, the Idiot and so on, Nietzsche liked that very much. This extremely fine-grained, exaggerated obsession with the subtleties of the human psyche. Uh, Nietzsche is just marvelous on that. I mean, he really gives wonderful portraits of human types. 
And this is uh, mother's milk to 20th century intellectuals. Stanley Rosen, of all your books that you've uh, written over the years, which ones sold the best? Uh, well, actually, the one that's selling the best by far is a book that I edited for uh, the Book of the Month Club, and Random House did the uh, uh, trade edition. It's, a, it's called uh, The Examined Life, and I won't try to describe it in any detail. But of my own uh, monographs or philosophical works, I believe it's correct to say that a, a work called Nihilism uh, has, has done the best. Uh, that was published many years ago by Yale Press and is now out again, uh, uh, released, reprinted by St. Augustine Press. I, I would guess uh, uh, the Nihilism book. How many of your books are still in print? Uh, all of them. So you can buy everything that you've written? Everything I've written. <laughs> that, that's unusual, isn't it? Well, I've been very fortunate. Uh, I have a, a contract with the, the St. Augustine Press, uh, which commits them to bringing into print everything of mine that has gone out of print. So they've reprinted uh, four or five titles of mine, you know, which after 20 years went out of print. Who is, uh, who are they? Who's the St. Augustine Press? Uh, that's an outfit uh, located in uh, Notre Dame in, South, in, in uh, South Bend, Indiana. And uh, uh, they publish, uh, they reprint scholarly, philosophical, religious books which have gone out of print, but which, you know, still command a certain audience. And uh, they do a, a bit of uh, original publications. I think they intend to expand that side of the thing. But uh, they, they've brought a, a wide range of, of philosophical works uh, back into print and plan to keep them there. It's now not so difficult, I gather. I, I can't explain all of the technicalities. But apparently new techniques of uh, producing books enable publishers to keep them in print longer than was the case previously. Uh, so yes, uh, I have been very lucky. Uh, they're all in print. Our uh, book TV producer, Richard Hall, is responsible for putting this all together. And in a few moments, we're going to see a discussion by a group called the Philosophy Book Group meeting at Bibelow's Bookstore in Timonium, Maryland. They meet every month. It's just north of uh, Baltimore. And uh, they met on August the 28th for seven, that was actually seven days after the 100th anniversary of Nietzsche's death, Nietzsche's death. You've seen this tape, uh, Professor? I saw about 15 minutes of it, yes. Uh, what's your sense? Uh, I, I didn't <laughs> count the number of people there, but probably, what, 20 people in the room at least? It was a larger crowd, I thought, than the one we did, uh, than, than the one that uh, was discussing the Republic. I had the impression it was a bigger room and, uh, and a larger crowd. Uh, maybe 15 people, yeah, that sounds right. And what did you think when you watched the 15 minutes of it? Well, I was uh, fascinated, as always. Uh, I, I, I would say this. These people got exactly right how dangerous Nietzsche is. Those of your audience uh, who will stay with the show, you know, and watch the, uh, the discussion will see that come out quite clearly. These people, these, the people uh, understood clearly that, that, uh, that Nietzsche is a dangerous man. What why, they, why is he dangerous? Well, because he's teaching us to destroy tradition, to create new values. That's always dangerous. He's, uh, he's not a Democrat. I think they saw that very clearly for the most part. Uh, for all the, 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 in other words, the reasons that I gave before, they, they perceived those. Where they went wrong, to the extent that they did go wrong, is that there was a tendency on the part of some of the members of the club to interpret Nietzsche to be saying that every individual must create his or her own values. You see, that would be too democratic an interpretation of Nietzsche. It would also, from his standpoint, and frankly from mine, lead to complete chaos. Nietzsche was not teaching that every individual person create his or her own values. What he was teaching is that the great person, the superman, create a new set of values which will be disseminated down by teaching and other modes of influence into the multitude and thereby raise them up. I don't think they quite got that right. A third point that uh, interested me was that uh, they seemed to feel, or at least a, a vocal segment of the group seemed to feel, that Nietzsche was very cynical. Now that's not the right word. I hope I have not misperceiving them. I think that's what they said. Nietzsche is ironical, and he has a wonderfully uh, uh, complicated sense of humor, and he doesn't share many illusions of the average person. But he's not cynical. A cynical person I take to be someone, I mean, at least in the current usage of the term, a cynical person is someone uh, who uh, really doesn't believe in anything and wants to cast doubt on everything and is a kind of a, a destroyer rather than a creator. You see, from Nietzsche's standpoint, cynicism is dissatisfaction of a powerless sort. You know, we just make fun of things. What Nietzsche does is to make fun of things in order to destroy them so that the ground can be cleared for him to create something new. 
So I think these people perceive something. In other words, they notice that Nietzsche is an, a, an ironic and, and, and in many ways an entertaining writer, but he's not cynical. They took his violent denunciations of, of democracy, his invocation to war, his statements that blood will flow in the streets, that the blonde beast will come down, and so on. They took that as a kind of cynicism, if I understood them correctly, towards uh, humanity in general. And that's not quite the way I would describe it. Cynicism is not quite the right word. From what you know of him, if he had to live in this time and had to do the circuit, the television shows and all that stuff <laughs> and the lecture series, what would, what would people think of him before he became mad? Well, he was uh, a great gentleman. I mean, it's interesting contrast, you know, th this man who, uh, who advocates violence and, and, and write, wrote one book, uh, true, many people think he was mad when he wrote it, Eke Homo, Behold the Man. One, one, one chapter is called I Am Dynamite, and section is called Why I Write Such Wonderful Books. I mean, he was really obsessed with himself. He knew his own greatness, you know? I mean, there was no, I, I wouldn't call it, well, there was no, no false modesty in Nietzsche. On the other hand, as a person, from all the accounts that we have, and you know, many people have left their reminiscences of encounters with Nietzsche, he was a, a gentleman. He was extremely gentle, which is a, a, a separate term, I, not just a gentleman in the, in the sense of having polished manners, but he was a gentle person. I mean, I don't think he could have hurt a fly. He was very considerate of other people and uh, uh, very quiet and uh, uh, I think quite engaging. It could be good fun, you know, at parties. He was a very witty person. I think people would like him, provided that the, uh, that the interviewer did not go on to ask for further details of Nietzsche's philosophical uh, positions. Because once those came out, in our time, if they came out, if my, in other words, if my interpretation of Nietzsche is correct, Nietzsche's statements would be regarded with horror by uh, most intellectuals and uh, uh, thinking people in the uh, present uh, social and political circumstances. So he was, a, he was one of these uh, prophets of violence who was himself an extremely quiet man. That was apparently not true of Karl Marx. I mean, I'm not a big expert on Marx's life, but I do uh, know that he was a rather disagreeable and uh, nasty fellow. No one could have said that about Nietzsche. Nietzsche was extremely nice. By the way, uh, in case people have just joined us, uh, Stanley Rosen, who teaches at Boston University, uh, has written this book that's in print called The Mask of Enlightenment, Nietzsche's Zarathustra. Did Zarathustra live? I don't think anyone knows. I mean, it's just one of those legendary figures. So just, uh, when did Nietzsche, did he make up the, is it? No, no, no. I mean, it's a traditional figure from uh, ancient Persian mythology, the ostensible inventor of morality. He might have, there might have been a man who did this. I, I wouldn't know. When you're uh, teaching Nietzsche, yeah. what, what do you find the reaction of your students to be to him after they've had a, a lot of him? Some of them are repelled by him for reasons that will be clear to anyone who's been listening to this interview. But on the whole, I find that the students are excited by Nietzsche. And, you know, the reasons are various, but Nietzsche is just an extremely exciting guy. For example, I found, uh, to my great interest, years ago I used to try to teach Kierkegaard, whom many people sort of link, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for bad reasons, uh, with Nietzsche. He lived somewhat earlier than Nietzsche. Kierkegaard was a very exciting writer, he was a brilliant uh, epigrammatist and a critic of uh, the establishment. He was a religious writer. The students don't go for him. They don't, they, they don't, they don't like him. Nietzsche appeals. Nietzsche is interesting. There is something about, the, uh, something about Nietzsche that excites students. And it certainly is his invocation to uh, go to the heart of things, not to be uh, bound by tradition, to understand or to try to understand what it means to be a human being and uh, the various uh, emphases upon uh, creativity and uh, self-overcoming. A lot of the students like it, but some, a significant minority, are repelled and frightened by it. Dr. Uh, Rosen, I'm sorry we're out of time, and right. uh, we really appreciate you spending time with us and telling us all about this, and uh, thank you and good luck up there at Boston University, and we hope to talk to you again soon. Thanks, Brian, so much for inviting me. Enjoyed it.